Hey, hello traders. Welcome to a new week of trading. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for Daily FX, and we're here to talk to about uh, the top fundamental themes, as we usually do here on a Monday. A quiet Monday, because we are actually dealing with a U.S. holiday, the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, which takes us offline, but we still obviously have uh, other markets around the world open, so I did think it was worthwhile uh, to open up our conversation already today. This is especially true because already starting uh, with the upcoming 24 hours, we're going to hit some very heavy fundamental turbulence and it's really not going to settle down through the rest of the week. This is a very fundamentally oriented week that we have ahead. Uh, so it does uh, warrant some uh, some early uh, anticipation and early preparation into what's ahead. Now before I dive into it, just give me a confirmation of why yes if you would. Just uh, tell me if you can see in here. Uh, currently we're on the pound dollar chart. I switched it over uh, as we will definitely be starting right here. All right, I see some yeses coming up, so this looks like we're good to go. Okay, so obviously we're starting off uh, with the British pound, uh, and we had a pretty sizable gap on the pound going down to the hourly chart. This uh, is of a magnitude that we don't really see very often in the most liquid of currency pairs, but uh, certainly the risk uh, always exists over the weekend where you can get a 1.5% plus gap to the downside. Now. On a daily chart, you can see a little bit more uh, where the context of this already significant gap is. One of the biggest gaps we've seen in quite a long time, uh, I think all the way back to the Brexit um, actual fallout, you can see the gap between the uh, close on the uh, actual post-Brexit day and then subsequent open that we had after the weekend. Uh, this is comparable to that. But even beyond the scale of the gap, we're also talking about a move down to levels that uh, actually represent a 31 plus year low if you take out the intraday flash crash period. Uh, just a little bit of a, a side, an aside on that flash crash, we talked about it when it happened, did a video on it, and wrote articles about it, so uh, it shouldn't be too uh, surprising, it shouldn't be something that we are not already familiar with at this point, but it does deserve some uh, some reference and that's because we are now retesting that level and the questions of liquidity uh, start to become a little bit more prevalent when you're already at three decade lows. Are we in a situation with the British pound where it is turning into a currency that uh, uh, is extraordinarily exposed to sudden bursts of volatility where we can get uh, you know 1.5 percent gaps on a regular basis we can see a sudden uh, plunge of 500 pips uh, out of the blue uh, or is that just kind of a one-off well I don't think it necessarily has to be a one-off but I don't think that we are at the same time getting a point getting to a point where the British pound is uh, prone to these types of extremes now, we do see these extremes around the FX market, but they are almost uh, expressly uh, isolated to the illiquid. All right. Now, what happened during this pound flash crash back here in October was a period of illiquidity. And it was one due to circumstances of the markets. It was two during the conditions that we are facing and three anticipation of something that was more significant the week following. So that was a perfect storm, if you would, of uh, conditions that would lead to that kind of movement. And they actually did, I think it was the Bank of International Settlements did a review into whether there was something hinky or uh, something that was uh, an underlying disaster waiting to happen. And their results were exactly what we talked about the day after, which is essentially that was just a, a, a clashing of, of unfortunate conditions. So what we have in flash crashes like that was the illiquidity, illiquidity conditions uh, conforming. So uh, people not wanting to take ma massive long positions already at uh, those extraordinarily lows. Uh, we have the Asia trading session which has happened during where there are very few market, uh, banks and traders and participants online to give uh, a equal footing to both sides of the markets. Uh, and we have anticipation at that point of what was coming into the next week. So it was a unique situation. It can be replicated, but we have to think about the conditions that would have to replicate such a move. Uh, and you could say the holiday conditions that we have now with the US, for example, and most other markets offline, that Asia open gap 
it certainly does kind of reflect the same kind of situation. Also, uh, pushing down to those multi-year lows, anticipation of Theresa May's uh, speech tomorrow, these are all similar conditions. So you get a similar kind of output. But I wouldn't go around thinking that this is going to be main stay. I don't think that this is going to be a normal uh, routine, although uh, being at these lows certainly does uh, offer uh, a kind of shift in the way that the sterling trades. So do be cautious of that. It's not just the pound dollar. It is all the sterling crosses because the pound dollar is the most liquid and its influence will echo, echo out through the sterling pairs. So when we look at something like this, always be aware of the conditions. Uh, and other questions arise out of how the sterling and cable in particular are trading. Uh, questions of, will the Bank of England intervene on behalf of the exchange rate, which uh, more and more common nowadays. We know the, the, the Chinese authorities are doing it. We know the Mexican authorities are doing it. And others around the world, uh, the BOJ is probably tempted to do it, but probably wouldn't have an effect, so they haven't been. Uh, but it's it's tempting to presume that the, the UK UK Central Bank is going to do the same. I don't think they will uh, because it would be very ineffective. They're fighting themes that they cannot fight uh, and it would just be throwing money into the system and once you recognize that a central bank is impotent, you don't believe any other uh, efforts they put in. And a good example of that, or actually two good examples of that, is the ECB and the BOJ, who have been struggling to generate the kind of influence economically and market-related that they had in previous years. All right, so they're in, in essence, they have zero uh, effect on the market, which if there's another crisis that arises, that's a very big problem. Perhaps in quiet seas not an issue, uh, but if you have rough financial seas and you need to react as a central bank because you are the stabilizer, we have a real problem. I don't think the Bank of England goes down that route. Mark Carney himself is uh, uh, clearly a, a more conservative view uh, when it comes to the extreme monetary policy practices. Uh, so I am very skeptical that intervention, is going, which would be the most extreme, uh, is going to be a tool that they consider. All right, and that they, they pursue. But remember the kind of abnormal trading that we're going to get because of the conditions, because of the way that the uh, sterling is posi positioned at multi-decade lows. Uh, this is certainly something that can arise and create some uh, skew in trading potential. If you are a long uh, or your pound bull, Let's say you're, you're looking to long uh, go long pound dollar or other pound crosses along the sterling. Be cautious because uh, you can get quick moves uh, to the downside. I don't think that they last very long, but they can be exaggerated and severe. And you don't want to be caught up in something like that. You want to make sure that any kind of bullish view that you get and that you try to expose or put on, that you have uh, clarity and conviction on the momentum uh, that you'll have play out. Otherwise, you're going to invite a lot of risk for a uh, little reason. Uh, the same being said to the short side, if you are a pound bear because you think that the, the thing is just going to keep uh, faltering uh, as Brexit fears compound upon themselves, which we'll talk about my view on this in just a second, but I don't think that they will. Um, be careful because if you uh, go short, you might get a, a sudden burst of support in your direction, but at the same time, the consistency is going to be much more difficult to feed through All right, because we're already at multi-decade lows and getting generating more speculative momentum in that direction. Uh, with that kind of support, it's pretty difficult to sustain. All right, because you're not going to get a lot of uh, exaggerated shorts, already super saturated short interest uh, to really build upon itself. Uh, and uh, thin liquidity is not really uh, an ideal environment to build up on momentum. All right, but let's talk about the less the circumstances and market conditions, as I call them. Uh, and let's talk about the fundamentals here for the sterling. We're heading into, as I said, a, a pretty packed week um, for event risk. Already through the open, we've had a significant decline in the pound, which we just saw. That was related to anticipation of uh, UK Prime Minister Theresa May's uh, speech that she's going to give tomorrow. The focus of that speech is details and priorities in uh, the Brexit. Uh, the UK's separation from the EU. Now, one of the big contentions of this uh, significant milestone is that we haven't really seen 
the details for the UK's position. We, we know pretty clearly what the EU intends to do and uh, some of the unintended or uh, unspoken objectives of the EU, which I will allude to in a second. But we haven't had a lot from the UK. Why? Because this is actually quite difficult. Uh, you're looking to negotiate and you're hoping for the best possible outcome and that best possible outcome is the EU will allow you to control uh, the immigration uh, which has, was a big uh, sticking point uh, when they were actually voting on the, e the UK referendum uh, or the EU referendum in the UK uh, but also access and influence over the European courts uh, on the UK and other uh, supranational influence. Uh, at the same time they would prefer to keep the access to the single market, which is essentially a tariff-free trade with the European Union, one of the largest, actually the largest uh, collective economy in the world, uh, prior to the UK leaving, of course. Uh, and that is not a small thing. That is a very important uh, milestone. That's a very important aspect of the UK's economy. Uh, half of exports go to the EU and they're tariff-free. If all of a sudden you start uh, putting a tariff or a tax on those exports, those exports are going to start to uh, reduce significantly. So there is a big concern about where the priorities stand. And as we heard from, I think it was the Times, uh, that uh, put out uh, uh, the content of uh, some of her speech, or at least the highlights, uh, it seems that she is willing to go, as we, they call it, hard Brexit, meaning to give up the access to that tariff-free trade in order to get the other aspects that are very important to the government and uh, what they read from the actual Brexit vote. Uh, so that has economic and financial implications for the UK and it's read pretty clearly on what it means. Uh, very negative for the British pound. Although quite interesting, if you look at the FTSE 100, it doesn't seem to be that bad. Uh, we did have a pullback which technically uh, is the first bearish close all right, from close to close that we've had in 15 trading days. Uh, this is quite remarkable. Uh, and actually, I believe David Cottle wrote an article about this last night uh, in the Asia session. And this is unique because why is the UK uh, equity market advancing so aggressively on the assumptions of Brexit? Well, uh, one of the m main considerations or the main drivers of that is the weaker currency, which presumably makes uh, UK exports more attractive. Uh, that's simple uh, connection being drawn. But this, if that's the case, then the Brexit, which you uh, all of a sudden add a tax uh, or, or return tariffs uh, to EU exports, the benefit of a cheaper pound is going to significantly askew. And that uh, positive implication for equities starts to retreat very aggressively. So it's uh, remarkable the relationship that we have here. It's a dynamic that uh, is very clear, very strong, but at the same time, one has to presume that it's going to be unlimited engagement. Uh, so when we look at something like uh, the consecutive VAR uh, advances or declines for a market that's momentum uh, and consistency and you're at record highs for equities, it, it does really flash a concern, a, a, a uh, uh, contrarian uh, flag. We should be very concerned about the uh, consistency of this and the ability to maintain this advance. All right, but Theresa May in her speech, we'll see what she has to say, but I have little doubt that it's going to reflect what was already leaked. Um, they often leak the contents or at least the, uh, the spirit of the statement to get a reaction to the market or from the market. Uh, they also do it to kind of diffuse a more extreme response uh, when it's actually delivered. So there isn't as much buildup and then uh, detonation. It kind of uh, dissipates uh, or softens the blow but I don't think that it will deviate too significantly. The question is how much follow through. Now there's a lot of talk um, from uh, different analysts, economists, uh, and other market participants uh, and their assessments of where the pound's going. And I have to say that I am on a different, uh, I'm in a different direction than they are. There's a presumption that the sterling is just gonna keep dropping uh, as uh, Brexit 
milestones are met. But I don't think that, I obviously think it do and it can continue to decline, but I don't think that it's gonna go very far. And I don't think it lasts for very long. Why? Because we're already pricing in a, a worst case scenario. Uh, one month chart of the pound dollar we're already at multi-decade lows. We've already seen a significant depreciation or devaluation of the sterling of uh, massive 15 per, plus percent. You're already uh, pricing a situation in which the UK is going to suffer uh, economically, financially, and essentially be a trade pariah. Uh, but in reality, it's not going to be that bad. Yeah, th th if they go for a hard Brexit, th there's going to be some more pain than there would have been otherwise. But it's not going to be a constant uh, drip of panic. Uh, we already priced in a lot. And as you cross these milestones and you confirm, yes, she's going for a hard Brexit. All right, well, if that's the case, then we know what the likely array of circumstances are going to be after that. There's a much more limited field of possibilities. And then as we make the next step, uh, the Constitutional Court in the UK deciding whether or not the, uh, the Parliament has a say in the Brexit negotiations. That further reduces the possible outcomes. And then we're going to have, obviously, the full suite of uh, no negotiation taxes and tactics if she doesn't give it to us here and now, uh, but the uh, Parliament has actually requested it. Uh, they given a time frame by mid-February. Right? That's another means of uh, narrowing it down. And then, of course, when she actually uh, triggers, uh, triggers or invokes Article 50, which sets the timer and starts the negotiations, that further drops it down at the end of March. So, as we become clearer and clearer what exactly path we're going to take, uh, it's going to be clear and clear that uh, we should not necessarily presume the worst case scenario is the uh, most probable outcome, which it, it isn't, all right? but we're pricing it that way. So I do think that this is something that uh, certainly represents a saturated view, kind of like how uh, the US dollar is kind of saturated on the probability of one and a half rate hikes this year. All right. If there, if we only stick at one and a half rate hike potential throughout the entire year, the, pound, the dollar's not going to rise anymore because it's something we're already fully pricing in. But if the Fed actually looks like they're going for two or three, that's not fully priced in. Or if they pull back and they only go for one, uh, that's weaker than what the market is pricing with the dollar. So the dollar will pull back. All right. This is uh, properly reflecting the value of what uh, is in front of us. So the sterling has a very big milestone, very big catalyst. Uh, we'll have to watch very closely, and obviously we have uh, guys on the UK, uh, UK hours that will be putting out material as it's coming. All right, they're going to give you the updates as it's uh, being updated. So uh, keep an eye on the real-time news feed first, and then obviously as uh, they have time to write up the actual rundown, uh, we'll have uh, we'll actually have articles and such on it. But Another thing to watch in, uh, in contrast to Theresa May's speech, also watch the UK inflation figures. Uh, Carney uh, just spoke, and the contents of his speech were, I mean, we knew exactly what he would say. We, he's not been very uh, shy in his views of, uh, uh, of the Brexit and what it means. Uh, he did essentially reflect the same uh, themes that he's given to us uh, week in, week out, month in, month out since the Brexit was, was pushed through. Uh, but watching this will tell us, all right, if there's inflation picking up because uh, uh, we have global inflation pressures and although it should be said the weaker currency can uh, bolster inflation through input or imports, I do think that that's a factor. Uh, what that uh, means to uh, the RPI and PPI in particular and then eventually get into CPI. But that pressure creates kind of a dichotomy. What does the Bank of England focus on? The unsubstantiated and potential future risks of economic impact from the Brexit, or do they react to inflation, which is their primary uh, focus as a central bank? All right, that, that's going to be a question that they have to answer. And uh, he said that uh, they're allowing, they would allow for inflation to get away from a little bit, uh, but they wouldn't go for too long. So this is going to be uh, data that is certainly worthwhile. And if you're watching the pound, also the following day we have uh, UK employment figures.
Okay. Oh, uh, and it also happens to be the week of the World Economic Forum, uh, or is more pop popularly called the Davos meeting of the elite, uh, the 0.01% uh, and really a lot of the media come and join and talk about uh, the direction and uncertainties of the world. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting uh, speeches that are being done and by very important people. Uh, a couple of them uh, I do think are very important, uh, including uh, some about the UK uh, and the separation from the EU. Uh, in fact, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Philip Hammond, is going to be speaking about that on Friday. Uh, but another aspect of this is not just what happens to the UK, what also happens to the EU. All right. I think this is really underappreciated, and there are a number of speeches uh, related to this, but European Disunion and uh, others, keep you can actually see what uh, speeches are scheduled, uh, but keep an eye on the euro. When you look at something like the euro pound, the pound suffers more and you get a euro pound gap to the upside. Uh, not too much of a surprise, but is it fairly valuing uh, what the situation is? No, it's not. The euro is certainly facing a lot of pressure. And this is uh, what's really interesting from the Brexit. We always think about what the UK's position is, uh, what the ramifications of the UK. What about the EU? I'm, fir I'm a firm believer that the Brexit is a far greater risk for the EU than it is the UK. Why? Well, we know what the, we know what the tally, the score is for the UK. They're losing access to a tariff-free trade to the uh, one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, it's going to be a mess of trying to reestablish uh, trade uh, relations and uh, establish new uh, law replacements for uh, some of those things that were controlled by uh, the EU constitutional courts and the like. Um, but we know what those are. What happens to the EU? And a lot of the assumption is, oh, they're just going to carve out the UK as an economy and, uh, and a related uh, static uh, measurement for GDP for the entire group. But it could very readily mean more countries leaving the EU. And this is one of the big risks. And we talked about this months ago, uh, but we need to start asking ourselves again, uh, what would be better for the EU if the UK struggles after leaving their group? or if they do well. If they do well, then the relationship, economic relationships will remain very uh, robust. Uh, you don't want a trade partner to do, uh, to underperform because that means that the relationship will certainly spill over uh, to weak economic uh, impact to the rest of your group. Now, it won't necessarily swamp your economy, uh, but their weakness will certainly uh, slow your economy. So you want them to do well on that front, but if they do well, the UK does well after leaving the EU, it's going to be a, a screaming uh, support for other countries who have been on the fence about whether they should stick with the EU because they're facing a lot of problems, uh, or if they just pack up and leave. Because look, the UK is doing all right. And the risk to the euro is that one of these countries is probably going to be not just an EU member, but a EMU member or a Eurozone member, meaning they are part and participant to the currency. And if they're looking to leave the components of the currency, which include the influence of the ECB, which is a big contention for most, uh, and obviously not being able to see your currency adjust so that you can get some of the epic economic benefits of a currency that reflects the state of your economy and system, then you have a real problem. All right, and the euro value is really dependent upon the sanctity and stability of that group. So this is a huge risk, all right, and I don't think that it's properly appreciated. Uh, certainly not on a euro pound, but even on something like a euro USD. All right, it is not properly appreciated. We did see, however, I think a little bit of reality that uh, this does have holdover impact. The gap to the downside on the euro USD uh, to open up the, the week, not as large as the pound, but certainly uh, measurable, all right, about 0.33%. So not something that is anywhere nearly uh, fully reflected in price, uh, but on the same theme, all right. 
the pound, you're already really discounting to a severe degree. The euro, you don't really appreciate uh, what this actually means. Where would you prefer to see the medium to long term opportunity? Would it be shorting the pound on this uh, unfolding slow motion car wreck or would it be the euro? All right, where there are no seatbelts, no uh, front impact uh, security and, and no airbag. All right, it would be more severe here. But the euro isn't the uh, isn't only looking at the long term uh, issues uh, related to the Brexit. Uh, the euro will also have a very high profile piece of event risk later this week on Thursday. The ECB rate decision. Now, I highlight this as read on my own calendar because I do think that this is quite important. Uh, they're not going to change monetary policy. I think that there is no reason to do so, but we need clarity on what they intend to do. If you recall back in uh, their last uh, meeting uh, late last year, they announced that they were going to expand their stimulus program by extending it. All right, they would cut the monthly purchases as of April uh, from 80 to 60 uh, billion euro worth of asset purchases, and they would carry it out uh, roughly through the end of the year although that, that language was vague, and I think vague on purpose. Now, this is very important because at this point, the ECB has been purchasing so many assets uh, that they are starting to run short on viable uh, stock to purchase. Now, not stocks as in equities, stock as in various assets that actually meet the requirements like sovereign debt. And there are very serious questions that they probably will run out, uh, especially at the clip that they intend to, to operate, uh, probably around uh, the beginning of the second quarter. Uh, remains to be seen because they obviously have been expanding the net of things that they could purchase. But this is going to be another uh, factor in where exactly does the euro go. All right. Now the euro, if the ECB had its way and it uh, didn't have any limitations, it would definitely prefer that its uh, aggressive easing efforts would lead to further depreciation of the euro. They would like to see their currency drop because it means uh, cheaper exports, all right? But it also means possible acceleration of inflation. Not necessarily a problem for a country that has been suffering with deflation or disinflation for a long time, uh, but when it starts to come, it starts to come very quickly and you have to react and you don't want to find yourself in the situation of stagflation, which is a stagnant economy and uh, actual inflation starting to run rampant. Uh, getting yourself out of stagflation for anybody who has taken economics courses is extremely difficult. All right, it's much more difficult. And given that the monetary policy effectiveness of the ECB is already just in the gutter, uh, they would find themselves very quickly in a, a, a no-win scenario. So the ECB has to give us a little bit more clarity. Are they just going to remain quiet, sit on their hands and play turtle, or are they going to give us a little bit more definition and guidance? Uh, it would behoove them to give guidance and say these are the assets that we intend to purchase. If this scenario arises where we don't have enough viable assets, we'll expand our uh, potential suite of purchases. But the loose language of just saying, oh, we have many tools, means zero to the market. All right. The ECB and the BOJ have spent much of their their goodwill, or in this case, uh, market moving impact, uh, and just throwing out uh, random statements nowadays doesn't provide any kind of positive feedback. If it does provide any feedback at all, it is generally negative. All right. So I think that this is very important. It might not be exactly uh, the market moving. Uh, event that you guys are looking for. Most of us, uh, and I include myself in this, uh, my, myself in this uh, kind of measurement, uh, but most of us look for really the big dramatic impact from the market, the massive 100, 150 pip, uh, even 200 pip move uh, after the announcement. Uh, but this is more of a, all right, where's the course of the euro? Can it get down to 102? Uh, this is going to be one of those things that decides whether it can or can't. All right, so it should be uh, measured as such. But the big picture, long-term kind of implication here is exactly what degree of control are they expressing? Uh, are they admitting to some of these limitations and uh, willing to uh, show that they can alter our course despite them? Or are they just going to let it lie and ignore it as if it's not there? 
that would probably be a bad or worst case scenario in that situation. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on this as well. Taking it chronologically, might as well. Uh, China GDP is going to be a very high profile piece of event risk uh, for the Chinese Yuan. I've been talking about the dollar uh, Yuan both onshore and offshore, although we can only practically trade the offshore, the CNH. Uh, most people reference the CNY, which is the onshore Chinese yuan. This you're not able to actually trade uh, if you're an international investor. Uh, this is uh, good for reference, though, because uh, there is much greater control over the USD CNY, and they actually set a uh, benchmark rate on a daily basis on this exchange rate but for practical sense you want to look at the USD CNH all right and if they're going to uh, see a separation between the CNH and CNY which there shouldn't be too much if they are uh, following their own lines of market determination like they've said in the past then that separation is going to lead to intervention and unlike the Bank of England who I said I don't think would intervene because uh, it's really not effective uh, the People's Bank of China is not so shy they definitely intervene and they do so quite freely they did to start off this year hence why the massive USD CNH drop uh, we can say that this uh, was due to you know an over leveraged market or any of uh, these other things but Realistically, that was certainly the influence of Chinese authorities, regulators. Uh, their concern is that the currency is dropping too rapidly. And for those that think that, oh, that's a that, that's what China wants, that is not what China wants. China does not want a massively devalued currency constantly going to new, uh, well, it's record low for the USD CNH because it's only been around for six, seven years, uh, but the uh, multi-year low for the Chinese yuan onshore does not provide or confer the value that they're looking for. One, all it does is further leverage the uh, anti-trade rhetoric that threatens them most of all, uh, particularly through Donald Trump, incoming uh, U.S. president-elect, uh, who has uh, really one of his strong platform points for American citizens has been cracking down on unfair trade practices. Uh, and this only places a big target on China's back, and they don't want to do that. But there's also the practical uh, risks that come along with a constant depreciated currency. It is a reflection of capital leaving China. All right? It's not just a, a positive, it's a negative. The reason that the currency is depreciating against the U.S. dollar is that people are moving capital from China into the U.S. dollar and into U.S. assets. And that if it gets too high or if it moves too abruptly, is a reflection of uh, capital flight, panic. There's a reason why if I were to align, and we've done this a number of times, uh, the, we'll do the VIX. Uh, the VIX over the dollar CNH, that the big aggressive moves from the dollar CNH align very nicely to the volatility in the uh, basic U.S. equity market. All right, capital flight from China can be a trigger for risk aversion, which was the case back in August, or it can be a reflection of where uh, fear uh, would generate the most uh, traction, meaning if risk aversion, get out of China. And Chinese authorities don't want that either. So they proactively try to intervene on behalf of their exchange rate uh, to prevent this influence. Because if they, let's say, uh, lose rain on their GDP figures, the, the steady course of slowing and more persistent uh, growth for the future, if they lose control over that, then uh, they're going to have a really hard time of making sure that everything remains stable. It's kind of like the ECB or the BOJ. Uh, they lose, once they lose uh, their influence, once they lose their uh, perceived control, then everything comes unhinged. Chinese authorities are very mindful of this. Uh, that's also why there's uh, rampant, there's rampant speculation that they also have control over uh, GDP uh, and data statistics uh, because it seems that they have the perfect balance of uh, 
uh, control over the exchange rate and uh, the pace of GDP and all these other elements which are reasonably not that easy to control under normal or, or open market conditions. Uh, I won't weigh into that, but uh, you can take it as you see fit. Uh, I don't think that it's a conspiracy theory whatsoever to assume that there are uh, certain uh, changes made all right, to make it uh, fit a more uh, convenient mold. But this convenient mold uh, is definitely uh, highlighted by data like the fourth quarter GDP. All right. Uh, GDP has just been on a steady and very compliant uh, growth plane, uh, having slowed from a just an overzealous, over rampant uh, expansion of 10 plus percent in the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Uh, and that was certainly a true reflection of the market, or primarily a true reflection of what happened there, uh, because there was a massive increase in lending and infrastructure spending. But since coming back from that and building up a, a quite possibly a uh, financial crisis uh, and possible bubble, if not handled properly, uh, they've pulled it back to more reasonable pace of growth so that they can promote stability. But the questions become it, how accurate is, and how honest is the reflection of that stability? Uh, that 6.5% GDP, uh, is that... Is it really that consistent? Look at something like the U.S. or the Eurozone or the U.K. or Japan. Yeah, well, Japan is the antithesis of Chinese GDP consistency. And you look at these major economies and they don't have anywhere near the persistent controlled figures that China releases. And is it just because China has that great of control over its economy and all the elements of economic output? No, not really. Yeah, so it comes back to that. So I'm not expecting a huge surprise here from Chinese GDP figures, but uh, I certainly am expecting a lot of skepticism from the open market, and I do expect a lot of pressure on the exchange rate, and I also expect a lot of pressure from trade partners, particularly in the U.S., and that brings us to our other uh, major event, which isn't really an event. I was asked by a number of people last week, is this really an event? Uh, U.S. President-elect uh, Donald Trump uh, inauguration on Friday. This is not an event in so much as I'm not expecting uh, a lot from or of meaningful traction. If you recall last week, we had uh, his first major press conference since uh, winning the election, uh, and the response from the U.S. dollar was not positive. Actually, let's go to the DXY. All right, it was a, a, a nasty little spill after some volatility. All right, now that's not because of what he said was necessarily negative to the currency, uh, but it was the absence of what was not said. Uh, he didn't talk about the fiscal stimulus programs. He didn't talk about uh, the details of trade policies. He didn't talk about uh, maybe the positive influences or the implications of uh, offering new hawkish Fed members. Uh, those elements that would have contributed to a positive or have contributed to expectations of positive U.S. growth, acceleration of growth, uh, they would uh, contribute to inflation, they would contribute to a faster rate of rate hikes, in other words, those things that really have bolstered the U.S. dollar. All right. He hadn't fulfilled what was already anticipated, and it's been a strong run for the dollar, it's been a strong run for U.S. equities, and we've had little to back it up. All right. So right now, this is on speculative merit alone, and traders, speculators are out on a limb. We need to shore up that limb or it's going to crack under its own weight. So he didn't deliver last week. I don't think this is the opportunity for him to deliver more than just rhetoric, uh, generally saying what he intends to do. He doesn't have a habit of giving uh, details, especially when the uh, focus of the event is more ceremony. Um, so I'm not expecting that. But it does remind investors that... We're still lacking for confirmation of these uh, necessary milestones, these necessary vows and policies to be put into place. All right? And it can't just be hung on one's word alone. It has to start being moved into action. Otherwise, traders are not going to stick it out with these kind of investments. So an important event risk, perhaps not 
as high profile as a definitive market mover, but it is a reminder. And if you want something that's more market moving in and of itself, take a look at the US CPI figure that we have on Wednesday. All right, this is speaking to what truly moves the Fed's needle. Uh, their dual mandate is employment and inflation, and they're already there on employment. You can dispute all you like the uh, underlying strength of the employment figures, I, I wouldn't disagree that the underlying employment figures uh, are not that great. Uh, but you can't be particular, you can't, uh, you know, uh, think that uh, the data is wrong when you are an economist on the Fed's perspective. You have to actually act with what the data is. Uh, the absent ingredient is inflation. But inflation pressures are starting to return. We've seen in the last non-farm payrolls figure that the average hourly earnings has picked up substantially. All right, And we've also seen inflation expectations have picked up in some of those consumer sentiment reports from the Conference Board and the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence. These are important milestones. We don't want to see how much of this is trickling down to the market's favorite inflation figure. Uh, this is not the Fed's favorite, but uh, they know what the market looks at, and they're, and they're very... Uh, responsive to where the data is and what the market does. So this CPI figure is going to be quite important. Speaking of Fed, uh, Fed uh, we have a lot of speeches throughout the week, including two Fed uh, Chairwoman Janet Yellen speeches. Uh, I don't think they're going to be as remarkable as people have presumed in the past. Uh, I don't think there's an occasion for it, uh, but certainly keep tabs on that and just know what's going to come out. A couple other high-profile pieces of event risk that are good for short-term volatility potentially, uh, but aren't really the systemic themes that we just talked about. Uh, we do have a round of U.S. earnings statistics that are coming out. Obviously, the first active trading day for the week in the U.S., Morgan Stanley. We're going to have some more banks, Goldman Sachs uh, included, and then we're going to also have uh, some of the large uh, corporates like uh, GE. We also have Netflix for the high-profile tech uh, group. Uh, so a nice smattering of U.S. second quarter earnings, which started out last week with the banks, which not surprisingly whatsoever managed to beat expectations uh, because GAAP is just the worst. Um, but that's not part of this conversation. Uh, getting into Wednesday, there are a couple other things that I do think that we should note, although I did say don't just watch uh, Theresa May's speech, watch the employment figures as well as the UK f inflation figures yesterday, or sorry, tomorrow and Tuesday. Uh, we also have the BOC rate decision. This is certainly a good one for volatility. The Canadian dollar has a, a history of being very abrupt in its response to surprises. Uh, nothing to suggest that there's going to be a surprise from this, but the surprising thing with the Canadian dollar is uh, they are still very effective in dictating monetary policy and they are essentially uh, on the fence. If there's anything that suggests that they're switching from dovish policy now to officially a hawkish policy, even a more distant rate hike until let's say 2018, it's still talking about a hike where most others are talking about a cut that can be very uh, significant for Canadian dollar pairs, especially for pairs like dollar CAD, where we have a tentative break of a very large channel, but it's not had anything to really gain traction on. All right, the weak dollar is one opportunity, but it hasn't really played out that way. It could be a surge in oil uh, because there is a strong negative or inverse correlation between oil and dollar CAD, yet oil is not really uh, taking that run and rallying with it has little reason to do so because there's so much ingrained skepticism over the OPEC cut and its ability to rebalance supply demand glut. But if you give uh, a reason like the Canadian dollar suddenly be, uh, turning into a hawkish currency, catching up serious ground to counterparts, that's a huge uh, change uh, that is very underappreciated. So much like the Euro's risk to the Brexit, not being uh, anywhere near uh, priced in. That could be something that proves a major market mover, although it's not my running expectation. Australian employment figures, these have been consistently market moving with surprises in the past, and the Aussie dollar has been doing very well, uh, particularly against the US dollar, as you can see here. It's been a nice swing from 71.50 up to 75, which doesn't seem too much on a pip by pip basis, but look at how it's moved in the context of the actual range. That's pretty productive. And some other currency crosses like the Aussie CAD, uh, Euro Aussie, all right, you can see that that's actually at the bottom of range. And that could be quite productive if used properly. So uh, important piece of data to 
uh, mark on that calendar. Uh, the housing data from the U.S., the tick data from the U.S. Uh, aren't nearly as market moving. They're going to be shunted to the side because we're paying attention elsewhere. Uh, we also have the ECB survey of professional forecasters, what they expect. Uh, we also have a lending survey that's going to come out on Tuesday, which kind of breezed over because it doesn't have a lot of market moving potential. But one other uh, euro area of interest that I think is worth noting, the Greek sovereign credit rating. If you were watching actually into the end after the close of the U.S. session on Friday, uh, Italy's uh, credit rating was downgraded by the DBRS, who is the Canadian credit rating group. They're not one of the main three, the S&P, Fitch, and Moody's, but they are nevertheless the fourth of the major uh, rating agencies that is used by European uh, authorities, including the ECB, to gauge whether um, a country uh, actually gets access to certain uh, bins of opportunity to sell one's assets for, you know, full uh, full dollar, for full euro. With the DBRS downgrade of Italy's debt, uh, it now is out of the top A status. It was never at the top, top, uh, but it's now out of that uh, even category, which is going to be a cost to Italy, and Italy is under a lot of pressure. It doesn't need additional costs to finance its debt, uh, so that's going to be a significant one. Greece, in this context, should be watched very closely. There's been some optimistic upgrades in, in outlook, at least, if not credit rating, uh, for Greece in past months. If there are uncertainties and risks that are being priced in anew, uh, definitely keep a close eye on this credit rating for Greece. This is going to be uh, quite important. And, of course, throughout the entire week, you're going to have these WEC or Davos discussions. Uh, one of the bigger ones in my book is going to be one on Friday, who includes Kuroda, Schabel, uh, Lagarde, uh, Hammond, and others. And they're going to be talking about the global economic outlook. All right, You want to see what these major policy officials expect, because what they do with uh, fiscal, financial, and monetary policy really depends on what their anticipation is. Uh, so you want to see what the assumptions are here. So a lot of this event risk is on the docket, uh, and uh, it's important to mark. Uh, all, most of it's on the economic calendar on daily FX. It, this is my Manic Crisis calendar. If you don't have it, I email this out on Fridays typically uh, each week. Uh, so you can get on my calendar if you want that, or my distributions if you want that. But um, just mark down these things so that you're aware of when they're coming. And uh, always look at the event risk in context of, does it tap a deeper fundamental theme? Can this, you know, if there's a huge surprise on a piece of event risk, is it just going to uh, flare up and then die out? You're going to have a massive volatility response that just kind of uh, draws off to nothing. Or does it, if it taps into a major theme, maybe there's that huge spark and it gets a trend moving in a very serious way. All right. Trends don't just arise out of event risk. They have to uh, actually uh, speak to or aggregate, aggravate an existing fundamental theme. If you want to look at it from a more practical perspective, because uh, there are a lot of technical traders out there just like, I don't want to know fundamentals. In essence, it's just I don't want to have to learn it myself. It's too much work. Uh, but they always say it doesn't work. It does work. The practical way of viewing it is, all right, there is this thing uh, or this influence or this sway in the markets that really uh, the bulk of the market focuses on, pays attention to. All right, if 90% of the market is paying attention to Brexit, then event risk that uh, alters the view of Brexit is going to alter the view of 90% of the market. And that many people moving and motivated by that theme turns into trend. However, if you have a major piece of event risk that you know only 10% of people care about, but the surprise of which can still generate a, a large short-term move because 10% are responding, that's a good volatility event, but it's not good trend development. All right, so when you look at event risk, you always have to appreciate what the backdrop on why it would impact the market uh, is. So a lot to work with this week. Make sure that you are keeping tabs. Expect volatility. Don't necessarily jump to expect trend, though. Uh, I think that the conditions are better for developing trends, uh, but there is no guarantee that this event risk will align in such a way that can actually support those trends. If we do have trends, I would be very happy. Uh, I am a trader at heart, and I 
genuinely do want market movement. Uh, but uh, as they always say, uh, expect uh, the best, prepare for the worst. All right, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, I'll record this and post it on the website so you can re review it to your leisure uh, a little bit later today. So keep an eye out for it if you do want to review. Thank you guys for joining me this week, and uh, we'll do our Q&A tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, do bring them tomorrow to that Q&A. I look forward to seeing you there or in any of our other webinars into the future. Until we speak again, I wish you good luck trading out there.